Hello and welcome to Fact Files from the Front Lines as we continue our conversations with uh, leading medical practitioners at the forefront of the battle against coronavirus. My guest for today is Dr. Karan Madan, pulmonologist at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi. And uh, let's try and understand uh, uh, how he sees it being uh, in, uh, in many ways uh, running a discipline which is at the core of this uh, battle against uh, this disease. Uh, Dr. Madan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. So, first question: uh, Are you treating any patients right now, and uh, w w what uh, what are you seeing? Yeah, we have uh, uh, some patients which are admitted, and uh, yeah, they are uh, you know patients for uh, who did who tested positive. Some have mild, and some have a little more than a mild degree of illness, so they are undergoing treatment. So, yes. Okay, and and uh, how, roughly how long have they been there in terms of uh, I mean how many days and uh, what is the progression that you've seen if at all? I think it's it's variable, you know, because patients keep on coming and then once they are uh, you know uh, treated, their swab is negative, then they are also discharged. So mm -hmm. I think as uh, we see that we are in the middle of a lockdown, and the precise reason for this was uh, uh, an anticipation in possible you know uh, an increase in the cases which might occur. And to slow it down. So I think uh, we are going through a phase in which we have the situation evolves. So I think uh, over the next few days uh, we are just keeping a close watch. Right. So amongst the patients you have with you, uh, you said some have been cured. Uh, and uh, is there a percentage? I mean, roughly how many have been cured already or now tested negative versus those who are still under treatment? So I, it's it's that you know the patients who have come you, who come with usually mild symptoms and most of them you know would recover in an uneventual manner. And mm -hmm. this we are talking of the patients who've tested. Positive. Yeah, and yeah. Possible for an each person who tests positive. There might be some patients which are actually, you know, not testing positive, and many are, you know, sometimes not detected. This is the case in any situation or any country. Yeah. So I think um, yeah, it is possible that the ones with the mild symptoms are uh, recovering. Yes. Okay. Now, those who are uh, perhaps not recovering as yet, uh, are they older? Is there any any demographic insights? So I think uh, it's too early to say for us at the moment. Because I think there's a uh, there's a divide in the demographics of the cases which are there in you know many cases. So I think uh, uh, so that's why we are saying the next few days are kind of important to have a watch on this. Right, and and is your treatment path uh, the same as uh, uh, what many other practitioners are following? Uh, you know the HCQ plus uh, uh, antiretrovirals and so on. So I think uh, it's an important issue. The, the treatment lines are on the lines of uh, treatment as given by the ICMR, though we have our own, you know, the way we implement it at our center. So I think uh, what is important to understand is that there is no definite drug which mm -hmm. is, you know, of, uh, of a proven certain efficacy that this drug is going to enhance rapidly the clearing of coronavirus or make the patients get better quickly. Mm -hmm. In fact, the major trial of uh, antiretroviral drugs, which was actually not shown as a very positive study. So mm -hmm. I think use of drugs in coronavirus disease is still on a case-to-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. And patients who have mild to moderate, mild symptoms, they usually don't require any specific treatment and they get well with supportive treatment. Right. And and for those who do not, because, you know, a lot of people will watch this or are already watching and, and particularly if they're older, they're concerned, you know. So if something happens to me, uh, what is the kind of treatment that I can expect? Now, I know that there is no cure that has been recorded for coronavirus, but there are a lot of treatments which can definitely help. So hence my question. So I think uh, from uh, one of our protocols, we would uh, use on a case-to-case -case basis. For a mild patient, we won't give any specific yeah. antiviral treatment. For somebody who is a mild or a more than a mild kind of a presentation, on a case-to-case -case basis, use of maybe hydroxychloroquine or a use of a, a antiretroviral combination may be considered. Right. And uh, uh, some of the patients you said are still under treatment. Uh, are, do you see any of them have uh, have they reached the point where they need? lung support or uh, ventilator support? So I think uh, 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 too early so to say for us because a majority of the patients which we had till now were uh, basically patients who had a, who, you know who were detected as part of screening and who had a mild to moderate presentation. So I think too early to say but we are watching the situation closely. Right and and, uh, and I mean this is a slightly more uh, general question. So as you talk to your colleagues uh, in uh, in the profession, I mean, and when I say profession, I mean pulmonology specifically, uh, and, and I'm sure you are. What's the sense that you're getting today, as in uh, as we stand today at about 2,300 cases across the country? Uh, what are people saying in terms of the cases they're getting? Are they seeing any unusual spikes or any unusual anything beyond what is already known? 
So I think as of now, you see, you know, at some places, it's sometimes a new case comes sporadically or it's a first case or a second case at many places. So that's why we are saying that um, uh, we, are, we are in a phase then over the next few days are quite important. Because, you know, many of the uh, colleagues have uh, seen cases which have come to, uh, you know, yeah, them who have detected positive. But then how this uh, trend continues, it's important to see over the next few days. So, yeah, that's what we are observing. Right. Okay. Now, uh, 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 let me ask you a couple of general questions. So, uh, you know, you've been quoted in the past saying that, you know, this is, uh, uh, there are many coronaviruses already in the air. So, one is that it's not in itself new, but this is a new strain that we're dealing with. So, how could uh, the earlier strains affect you versus this strain? So, I think it's important to understand that the circulating coronaviruses, which usually called mild to mild respiratory illnesses, sometimes moderate, uh, they are they usually circulate and usually cause the colds and uh, those kind of problems. The uh, problematic coronavirus illnesses which came over the last uh, two decades was the SARS, uh, you know, which was there in the early 2000s, and the uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS coronavirus outbreak which were more severe. So I think uh, yeah, this, uh, this uh, the uh, COVID-19 disease, which we have now, also that virus is called as a SARS coronavirus 2, mm. because that virus has uh, striking similarities with the SARS virus. And the uh, reports which you see from the other countries that the severity of illness with this virus is more than the normal common cold or influenza. Mm -hmm. So that is why this is a little uh, different virus. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to say because sometimes these viruses change their character over time as they, you know, uh, circulate. Mm. Mm. So uh, it is also not very clear at this point of time that once somebody has it and gets cured of it, how long the immunity lasts and all those issues. So I think what we can say at this point of time is that uh, this viral illness is more uh, severe than the, uh, the common coronaviruses which circulate, excepting the SARS and MERS coronavirus. Th those are uh, the more right. severe things. So that's that's one thing. Right. So, uh, I mean, you mentioned immunity. Now, uh, one of the questions that's coming up now, or beginning to come up now, is that if you get this and if you are cured or if you emerge, uh, uh, you know, from, uh, uh, I mean, from being positive to then being negative, uh, is it likely that you may not get it again? So I think as uh, the time duration is too short to answer this, because mm -hmm. the, uh, the duration of the epidemic per se, if you see, is a kind of three to four months as of now, so from whenever it started. Mm. So I think uh, we'll have answers to these questions, but it also happens that if somebody has an influenza or a common cold, they tend to have it every, uh, you know, because these strains keep on changing. That's why uh, the influenza vaccine comes as a new batch every year mm. because the, the immunity and the circulating strains change. So, and as of now, uh, the vaccine. So right. I think, so I think these, these questions would be clear as uh, we have more time and then it will be clear. But it is possible that if the virus changes a little bit of its uh, character, then the illnesses may occur, though they might be a little milder in severity. Right. So tell us why the lung in itself is the, is the key target here and, and, uh, if, uh, and what happens because of that. And number one. Number two, uh, do people who have either a weak lung or a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, you know, are they more susceptible and therefore... The third question, in a way, uh, what can any uh, such people do about it at this point? Okay. So I think uh, it's important to understand that the uh, portal of entry of this virus uh, has got a specific kind of receptor in the human lungs and uh, through which it binds and uh, it has, it's got this affinity and from where it enters. And uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, not everybody gets a major lung problem. Uh, as you see, out of the detected cases, more around 80% are mild you know, kind of illnesses. Mm -hmm. This means that they usually don't have a significant degree of lung involvement. This means even if they have the viral illness, lungs are not the major kind of uh, site of attack and they are not majorly involved. So they would recover. Uh, so uh, uh, that brings us to the question that the 20% of the patients who have a little moderate and a severe kind of presentation, in them that may be a problem, uh, especially if somebody has got an underlying lung disease or comorbidities, especially diabetes, hypertension or heart disease. Those patients may be especially a little more susceptible to the effects, uh, so that's 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 to be noted. Right. So, uh, can such uh, uh, patients, or let's not say call them patients, let's say people who have already some kind of lung condition, and particularly if it's uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so therefore you know that you have it, uh, or maybe if you've been a smoker and you are suffering or some kind of uh, uh, weakness because of that. So, could you do anything to be more prepared at a time like this, or do you have to essentially subscribe to the same 
uh, process or that everyone or all of us are following? So I think uh, it's important that the only only way as of now we have is to you know make all possible steps to prevent yourself from getting it. Mm-hmm. Because it's very difficult to say that what a, the course of a disease and an individual patient may be, especially mm-hmm. if the person has got comorbidities. So mm-hmm. I think it's very important if you have a significant degree of lung disease, if somebody is say on oxygen or an advanced lung disease, that patient should try, a person should try to uh, practice social distancing uh, mm-hmm. to a degree which is more than what, you know, everybody else does. And maybe trying to avoid contact with, you know, uh, you know, minimum possible people and taking care of hand hygiene and all those precautions. So I think right. trying to prevent yourself would be the most important thing. Right. Okay. So uh, just to come back to that number that you quoted, which uh, many others, of course, uh, are also quoting, is that 80%. So 80% of people should not worry. I mean, you have to take all these precautions, but should not worry because this disease or this virus will not really affect you. Uh, would that be a fair statement? I think uh, it would be uh, more than that because we are talking about 80 persons who are diagnosed with the disease. Yeah. It, it's out of those who tested and, you know, uh, who were detected positive. Mm-hmm. Now, it is possible that we all realize that whatever may be the setting for, uh, you know, every case one diagnosed, there, there's a pool of cases which might be, you know, uh, undetected. So then if you see uh, uh, the uh, percentage of getting a severe disease would go even lesser. Okay. So, so if you say from the estimates from experts also, uh, if the risk of, you know, uh, a serious complication or mortality from influenza, which we talk, or a flu, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like 0.1%. But if you take an estimate of this coronavirus, it is actually nearly 1%. So so that would be, uh, so that would be, uh, you know, it is more severe than the common influenza. Uh, but, uh, you know, a large majority of patients would recover. That's important. Right, and and uh, and it's and it's lower. The 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 mortality would be lower than let's say an H one N one and uh, maybe even it, dengue. No, so for from an H one N one or an influenza, this would be higher. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, so but the influenza is lower than this, so it's more severe than the common influenza. Got it. Okay, now uh, how are you uh, infrastructurally uh, uh, prepared at this point of time? So I think uh, the, the the government is making you know a lot of steps and a kind of uh, uh, creating dedicated facilities where these patients may be treated. Uh, it's important. And then what is the line is that um, most of these patients may be treated in a separate uh, kind of an area and a designated place, which has the facilities for holding them, giving them oxygen or advanced ventilatory support. So I think um, uh, the preparations are more or less on the same lines at each facility. Right. And, and uh, I mean, at, let's say in a hospital like Ames, you obviously see a lot of patients coming uh, and for many things at all times. So uh, are you uh, taking any specific precautions or, uh, or the precautions you're taking are sufficient to ensure that things are under control? Yeah, I think the infection control precautions are important. So the, mm-hmm. the people who are engaged at the front who are screening and who are managing the, you know, the sick patients, uh, uh, get the adequate equipment and, uh, you know, yeah, the, preferably these patients are managed in a separate area, which is designated as a COVID area. So I think these are the important things to, you know, uh, practice at uh, any setting you are in. Right. And and you're also saying that broadly, uh, all most hospitals, including yours, are prepared uh, today infrastructurally for a surge in cases were it to happen. So see, the, the, these, this, this is uh, something, you know, which is difficult to say but it, because it depends on the trend of the cases which continues. Mm-hmm. So I think, um, yeah, so these, these things are quite dynamic. So mm-hmm. I think once, so because um, if you see the uh, uh, countries like Europe uh, where, you know, yeah, the, uh, or the US where the massive surge in patients has occurred. Mm-hmm. So I think it all depends and the situation is dynamic. So I think we'll have to see as it goes. Right. No. So what I mean is at this point of time, most hospitals, because I'm talking to other uh, or interviewing other doctors as well, uh, most hospitals seem to have standby capacity to take on a surge. I mean, yes, a situation like New York will is, is going to completely overturn everything. But I'm, I'm asking, my question is, maybe, let's say, if it goes from 2,000 to, let's say, 5,000 cases uh, at this point. I mean, we're still, uh, I'm assuming we're still uh, within control. So I think uh, the, those uh, dynamics, you know, the preparations occur at various levels. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, as and when uh, the uh, things happen, the capacity is also, you know, um, uh, moved accordingly. Right. So I think uh, difficult to say as of now, but let us see that uh, how the trend of the cases continues. Right. Yeah. And and last word of advice uh, from you, Dr. Madan, to uh, people who are watching or will watch uh, and how they sh- at this point of time, but which is now two weeks into the lock, uh, two weeks into the lockdown, 
uh, maybe another 10 12 days to go how how should they be uh, you know uh, leading their lives and taking or staying safe so i think uh, one thing is very clear there is no scope for laxity uh, there is a specific purpose for which this lockdown was enforced and such a you know uh, a lockdown of a, such a large population and one has to realize that uh, these are important and difficult decisions which are taken in the interest of the people per se and there's a specific purpose behind such an epidemiological strategy the precise idea is to obtain social distancing you want to slow down the spread of this epidemic you want to break the chain you want to have you know people who have this get okay at their own level so that they don't become transmitters and the people become more transmitters so i think uh, uh, i think social distancing has to continue even once this period is over hand hygiene and other precautions have to continue and i think uh, we are we will be also seeing you know uh, uh, situations which are you know that how do, do people prevent the spread from themselves to others right. so i think a selective use of you know mask in special situations so those are important things to be understood right uh, dr malan thank you so much for joining us and i uh, wish you all the best in your efforts and uh, and and give you and may you have the strength to continue this fight thank you so much thank you very much yeah.